In a State of the Union address last night, President Biden made his bid for 2024. He's already running before a sharply divided Congress. Republicans in the chamber voiced strong reactions to his campaign statements. Well, the overall GOP response, the president's policies are damaging the nation. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka brings us this coverage of the president's speech. Well, the president's big speech, a test run for 2024, pitching a message of progress and resilience amid Republican backlash and some uncertain economic headwinds. Mr. Speaker, the president of the United States. The first pitch. We've been sent here to finish the job. Faced with record high inflation, President Biden presented a rosy economic message of a strong job market and record low unemployment. We're the only country that has emerged from every crisis we've ever entered stronger than we got into it. In the president's first speech to a divided Congress. Speaker, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I look forward to working with you. <laughs> but if there was a temporary truce among lawmakers last night, it quickly evaporated over the coming battle to lift the debt ceiling. Let's commit here tonight to the full faith and credit of the United States of America will never, ever be questioned. And amid the economic uncertainty, a presidential accusation. Some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene shouting liar in the chamber. Well, I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. Leading to a live primetime negotiation. But it's being proposed by individuals. And a unanimous agreement over the sanctity of entitlement programs. As we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now. Seemingly not open to negotiation, a ban on assault weapons. Banned assault weapons now. And the divisive issue of abortion. If Congress passes a national ban, I will veto it. The president's calls for immigration reform. And let's also come together on immigration. Make it a bipartisan issue once again. Met with Republicans calling for more. After a week in which the country watched the Chinese spy balloon drama play out, the president touted the U.S. response. As we made clear last week, if China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country, and we did. For the ambassador of Ukraine, a standing ovation. We're in uniting our support of your country. We're going to stand with you as long as it takes. Among the guests sitting with the first lady, Tyree Nichols' mother, who buried her son last week. The faith of God, she said her son was, quote, a beautiful soul, and something good will come of this. Days after the release of police surveillance videos showing Nichols' brutal beating at the hands of police officers, the president called for police reform. Let's commit ourselves to make the words of Tyler's mom true. Something good must come from this. The State of the Union address met with a Republican rebuttal from the governor of Arkansas. It's time for a new generation of Republican leadership. Sarah Huckabee Sanders slamming President Biden for being weak on China and not enforcing immigration laws amid a humanitarian crisis at the border. The dividing line in America is no longer between right or left. The choice is between normal or crazy. The president did focus on unity in some key areas, but Republicans wanted more. They wanted more on the border. They wanted more on national security and more on a plan to try and fix the economy. The next big fight, the debt ceiling, with the U.S. Treasury Department saying the United States could default on its debts as soon as this summer. At the Capitol, Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, CBN chief political analyst David Brody joins us now. And, and David, I, I, I've got to say, I'm from political theater, it was pretty raucous last night. Uh, I remember uh, when someone called out, a, a House of Representatives member called out to President Obama, you, you liar, he was censored by his own party. Uh, I don't think we're going to see that this time around. So why is it more contentious than in years past? Well, that's right, Gordon. By the way, uh, yeah, that's right. Joe Wilson, uh, that congressman who said you lied to Barack Obama. We're living in a different age uh, in politics right now. It is way more contentious. And you would think, well, wait a minute, could it get any more contentious than maybe Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich back in the 90s? The, the answer is a resounding yes. 
Uh, we saw it play out in the speakership battle uh, with Kevin McCarthy, the populist wing of the crowd. We have Marjorie Taylor Greene screaming liar. We had an, uh, another one in the crowd uh, when Joe Biden talked about the border, or excuse me, talked about fentanyl, the fentanyl crisis, and uh, someone, a congressman yelling out, it's your fault. Uh, and so it, it just got really, really bad. And and obviously the big dust up last night, uh, Gordon, was all about Social Security, Medicare. And, and let's be clear, there is no fact check needed on this. Uh, what, what Joe Biden said last night about Republicans saying that they wanted to cut Medicare and Social Security in this fight over the debt ceiling is an out and out ball faced lie. Uh, and the reason for that is that Kevin McCarthy said the day before that that was off the table. Those cuts were off the table. And yet Joe Biden walked to the lectern at the State of the Union in front of the nation and said, Republicans want to cut Medicare and Social Security. That is why you saw the vociferous reaction. And this is the type of stuff we're dealing with in the politics of today. Well, clearly he was campaigning. I, I, what's your take on uh, he en enjoys conversion? I, ca I can't make any sense out of what, what, what did he mean with that? Well, I think can't make any sense of it. And Joe Biden, sadly, go hand in hand in the same sentence quite often, uh, Gordon. I, I think maybe what he meant when, with conversion is two, either one of two things. One, he was saying, I like the conversation rather than conversion. Or maybe he was talking about the conversion of the Republicans to see his way on it. I don't know. But that's a question for Joe Biden and Joe Biden alone, because at this point, we're not quite sure what comes out of his mouth at this point. And that reflects it. And don't take my word for it. 37% of Democrats don't want him to run again. 37%, Gordon, of Democrats don't want him to run for president again. That pretty much says all you need to know. I will say this. I thought he did a very good job at the beginning of the speech and about the, I don't know, about the first third of the speech talking about buy American, buy American. I mean, it was very economic populist. Uh, 42 times he invoked the word American, uh, 17 times jobs in the speech, six times infrastructure and the word manufacturing come up, came up five times. So he was clearly trying to go for that blue collar vote that the Democrats have lost over the years. And that, to me, was very prevalent, at least at the beginning of the speech, Gordon. Well, how, how do you rate it as a campaign speech? Because clearly he's kicking it off. And uh, yeah. while he hasn't announced, it, it seems pretty obvious to everybody. Um, so how do, how do you rate this as a campaign speech? Well, I, I, it's hard to say how I would rate it. I would simply say that he accomplished the goal. If the goal was to talk to the middle class of America, the Rust Belt of America, the heartland of America, the voters, in essence, that he's going to need, those independents and soft Democrats that went to Trump in 2016, and many of them still went to Trump in 2020, uh, the, the, uh, the electorate, the portion of the electorate that he's losing, well, then he did well. I, I would say, you know, B-plus, if you will. Uh, the problem is he'll be fact-checked on that all day. Remember, he talks about buy American, buy American. Well, let me just say two words for you. Keystone Pipeline. I mean, he, he nixed that project, which would have been American jobs, and instead we're buying oil from overseas um, a lot more because of that uh, nixing of the pipeline. So I can go on and on. I do think the contours of the race, Gordon, were defined more actually by Sarah Huckabee Sanders in the rebuttal, who said this is a choice between normal and crazy. And I think that, in essence, is what the contour of the race will be. Joe Biden will try to make it about economic populism and appeal to the Rust Belt and the heartland. Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying Republicans are going to appeal to common sense and say, really, the radical left wants to do all of this at your local school board and your PTA and the gender ideology and the critical race theory? It's normal versus crazy. Go with normal. And I think those are the contours of the 2024 presidential race. Well, that normal and crazy goes on both sides of that aisle. Uh, I think one of the things he was trying to get done as, in the speech is exactly what happened. He was trying to re trigger the Republicans to do exactly what they did, uh, to get up and shout and point and, and uh, sort of identify as we're the crazy. Um, and it, it, did, is that going to be a theme? Uh, the radical MAGA Republicans, it, it just seems to be a, a, a catchphrase now. Is that going to be the theme for the next two years? Well, Gordon, it's, that's such an astute observation. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, he was able to draw out, if you will, 
the reactions from the Marjorie Taylor Greens and other populists in the crowd uh, by, by getting that vociferous reaction and letting Americans see, hey, this is an unruly Republican Party. This is a, air quote, crazy Republican Party uh, that wants to kind of burn it all down. And I put that in air quotes, of course. And so, yeah, I think that was actually a pretty good political calculation uh, by Biden. So, so we'll see. But I, but I do think that has a lot to do with it, for sure. Well, uh, one, one thing back to the Republican response and, and a call for a new generation of Republican leadership. You mentioned that Democrats don't want Biden to run. It seemed like I was hearing in the Republican response they want a new generation of leadership. At the same time, it seems obvious uh, that it's going to be Biden-Trump again. Uh, so are, are we looking at divisions in both parties? And are we, are we looking at uh, a Trump-Biden redo, it's kind of like Ali Frazier all over again. Are, are, is, is that the, the destiny going forward? It feels like it is. Obviously, a lot of uh, political maneuvering going forward. Ron DeSantis will, will he or won't he get in? That will change the calculation quite often, Nick, uh, quite a bit. Nikki Haley will get in next week. Uh, so, so we'll see about that. I will say that what Sarah Huckabee Sanders did, just like Joe Biden was talking about economic populism in the speech, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was brought uh, on to do the rebuttal for one key reason. Just like the Democrats are losing middle class, blue collar, suburban, or excuse me, middle class voters, that blue collar, Rust Belt voter, Republicans are having problems with women in the suburbs. And there, along comes Sarah Huckabee Sanders, a mother of three, and kind of an all shucks feel to her. Uh, talking about just normalcy. And I think that's what the Republicans were trying to do on their side. And th that's the juxtaposition that we're looking at. And it'll be interesting to watch. I can't wait. I bought popcorn already, Gordon. I, bought, <laughs> that's all, I have a lot of it. Well, I, I don't know if popcorn's uh, the thing you want to be eating at what looks like to be a WWE match uh, yeah. of heavyweight fighters. Uh, this Maybe Excedrin. Maybe Excedrin. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we just leave the arena and let them fight it out and, <laughs> and tell us who won at the end of the day. Well, David, thanks for joining us. And I look forward to two years of wonderful politics. Can't wait. All right. Well, another news and this let's leave the theater. This is uh, unbelievable what's happening in Turkey. The death toll now, 11,000 and more bodies are being pulled out of the rubble. Heroic rescues are also being reported, and the disaster has touched off a worldwide effort to help the victims of this tragedy. Chris Mitchell has the details. Relief workers, search and rescue teams, and NGOs are arriving in Turkey and Syria ready to help. Turkish President Recep Erdogan called the earthquakes history-making. Experts describe these two earthquakes which are independent but triggered each other as exceptional ground movements unique in the world. The size of the opened fault lines caused a massive destruction over a huge area. For this reason, we are facing the worst disaster in the region and the world, not just in the history of our republic. While more rescue workers pour in from around the world, the stories of agony and ecstasy continue, with the images on social media at once heart-wrenching and heartwarming. This father is grieving for his baby killed in the earthquake. In this picture, a father holds the hand of his dead daughter in the rubble. This video shows a trapped little girl being given water from a bottle cap. Yet there are stories of dramatic and miraculous survival. Hundreds of Syrians roared in celebration when this family was freed after being trapped for almost two days. And the baby born in the rubble the other day is now in the hospital and doing well. And the sister and brother that many saw trapped under concrete have now been freed and safe. Many NGOs have responded to the disaster, including CBN's Operation Blessing, where Diego Traverso filed this report. Operation Blessing is on the ground in Turkey right now. As you know, the recent events with the earthquake that happened affect the whole the north region of Syria and Turkey and has been devastated. Thousands of people lost their life. Thousands of people lost uh, their homes, their shelter, where they were sleeping. And right now, the, the weather is not helping at all. Uh, the snowstorm is very intense. The weather is very, very cold. Uh, people is sleeping on the streets under a tarp. An Operation Blessing assessment team is here on the ground to see how we can reach the people that is in need right now. 
keep us in prayer, keep Syria and Turkey in your prayers. We're gonna be here for the next couple days. You will know better the situation and how we can support those families that lost everything. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support. The immediate response by Operation Blessing will be distributing thousands of blankets and hundreds of solar lanterns because millions are without homes and without heat or power. Additionally, Operation Blessing will begin distributing relief bags, which will contain blankets, basic hygiene items, bottles of water, and nutritional bar or snack. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, D Diego is on the ground now, and we're moving teams into position. We're finding it extraordinarily difficult just to get to the area. Uh, the airports were all shut down. There are allowing people who are part of disaster relief teams to travel to it. Uh, there was a sudden snowstorm, which is hampering uh, travel. But we're there, and we want to do even more. And right now, it's blankets and lanterns, solar-powered lanterns to help people uh, in their immediate need. But there's so much more here. And this disaster is of epic proportions. We need to do our part to say, yes, we love you. God loves you. We want to be there for in your, you in your time of need. If you want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, it's real easy. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us, Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check, or you can also text to give. OBDR, those letters, OBDR, which stands for Operation Blessing Disaster Relief, text it to 71777, or you can just go online to cbn.com or ob.org. Either way, do it now and be a part of this relief effort. Let's take a moment right now and pray for the people on both sides of the border. Um, the earthquake doesn't recognize borders. Mm -hmm. People are suffering in Syria. People are suffering in Turkey. Let's pray for them and believe that God will send relief and send it soon. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we come to you off, uh, in, uh, and stand in the gap for the people in Syria, the people in Turkey, the people that you love and the people that you died for. Lord God Almighty, send relief. Yes, Lord. Send relief. Lord, I ask that you even change the weather so that people who don't have hypothermia, aren't in, in snowfalls, but we can get relief supplies to them, the needed food, the needed water, the needed shelter, the needed blankets, everything that they need. Lord, enable us to provide. Ashley? And Father God, I just lift up the children, Lord. I just pray for the children, the families, God. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that there are more children that are being rescued in the, in the wreckage, Lord, and that there are more people being rescued and found and saved, Lord, in the wreckage. And I just pray for the rescue workers who are helping in that effort, Lord, helping in many different ways, God. I just pray that you give them wisdom and discernment on what to do and who to help, Father God. We just pray for your hand to be upon this situation. We pray for the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and may it guard the hearts and minds of the people, Lord. We just thank you for what you're doing, even in this disaster, Lord. Thank you that we can run to you, believing and having faith that you will bring something beautiful. You will turn the ashes into something beautiful. There will be joy for mourning. Thank you, Jesus, that you're doing this. In your name we pray and ask all of this. Amen. Amen. And amen. Highly suspicious. That's one assessment of the computer network failure that grounded all U.S. air traffic last month. The main reason? Canada experienced a similar outage the very same day. Cybersecurity experts are warning that breaches and shutdowns of critical computer systems are imminent and that our government needs to act now before it's too late. Gary Lane reports. Human error or a cyber attack? That was the major question after the computer network failure that recently grounded all U.S. air traffic for the first time since 9-11. While the FAA insists human error led to the outage, Canada experienced a computer outage on the very same day. This is what I would categorize as highly suspicious because these systems have redundancy they have backups, they have ways to be able to recover. So when I hear that there was a database error 
And then, as you said, there were two different systems that went down on the same time. I'm like, okay, saying it was human error keeps everyone calm. But in reality, it really does sound like a cyber attack and that something went wrong that was unplanned for. When looking for likely suspects in such a cyber attack, Russia would be a strong possibility because of its war against Ukraine and the help the U.S. and Canada are giving the Ukrainians. Russia lately has always been on the list, but we also forget that China is also a big target, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure. And there's also a lot of freelance cyber adversaries that are out there that are really big on ransomware, extortion, and things like that. So from my standpoint, it sounds like what we call a test attack, where they wanted to test and just see how vulnerable the systems were, whether they could get in, and how long it would take them to recover. So to me, the critical things for the FAA right now is to really figure out if it was a cyber attack, to figure out how they got in and make sure they fix it because this sounds like it's gonna be one of many attacks in our future. Given the FAA software is 30 years old, Cole and other cybersecurity experts say an update is long overdue. Daniel McCoy is an aviation expert with the Wichita Business Journal. Certainly they'll have to take a, a good hard look at this system and, and they'll have to identify any weaknesses or build in redundancies or, or uh, a full upgrade of some kind because uh, this was obviously um, problematic, but uh, given that, you know, they were able to lift it in a few hours, you see what just a few hours does um, to, the, to the network uh, when it's down. Although President Biden signed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill into law, Cole believes some critical network issues must be considered, not only for air traffic control, but other vital national computer systems as well. When you're dealing with critical infrastructure, like air traffic control, utilities, and even hospitals, uptime availability is critical. And any time you patch or update a system, there's a chance it could crash. I'm sure you've had at your home when you did an update or they said, oh, it's just a basic patch. All of a sudden things don't work and things stop operating. So it sounds bizarre, but the more critical a system, the less we update it, the less we patch it, and the more vulnerable it becomes. So how likely then is another shutdown or cyber attack, not only against an antiquated FAA computer network, but other critical government networks? Just how vulnerable are they? Unfortunately, they are very vulnerable. For that reason, you said these are old systems. They're not typically updated. They're not typically patched. And the big problem is they're starting to be interconnected. And that's where the problem comes in. These systems were designed and built to be what we call in cybersecurity an air gap, which means completely isolated from any other system or the internet. But what's been happening over the last year or two is they're interconnecting these to the internet and other systems to make them easier to use. And because of that, this to me is just the beginning. And this year we're going to see a lot more of these attacks happening because of that. All due to COVID-19 shutdowns and work from home now the new normal in our society. And instead of us weaning away from that, now that people are coming back in the office, we're actually doing more and more interconnectivity, which is great for ease of use, but is one of the worst possible things we can do for cybersecurity. This creates a huge national security problem. Although the FAA says it has made revisions to prevent a corrupt file from damaging the flight backup database, cybersecurity experts say Congress and the president still need to urgently address vulnerabilities to safeguard the nation from more devastating attacks in the future. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, it's chilling to think that there was a cyber attack simultaneously with the Canadian system and the U.S. system. That's clearly not accidental. What do we do as a country? Well, we need to make sure that we're updated all across the board. And whether it's our power grid, our water systems, uh, our air airport traffic, we have enemies in the world that want to take us down and definitely want to disrupt our economy. There's a whole new level of warfare now, whether it's space warfare, cyber warfare, uh, or just uh, old-fashioned terrorism, it's all happening uh, simultaneously. And where is our government and what are we spending our time on? 
Are we trying to solve our problems or are we just trying to win elections? Well, that's a good question to ask every politician. Ashley? Astrid lived a lie. Her boyfriend told her she was trash and that nobody would ever love her. And Astrid believed him. Their toxic relationship led her to abuse drugs and eventually to lose her own daughter. Love. I think love, attention. Um, know that I'm worth it. You know that, I, any, that I'm worth the time. I'm worth the hug, a kiss. You know that even though, you know, for everybody, I was nothing, a drug addict. At 27 years old, Astrid Gomez had become the person she'd swore she'd never be, a mom living with a verbally abusive man and a drug addict. I always used to say, like, I don't want to live this life. I don't want to grow up and be married to a man that we're going to, I am going to end up like my mom because I saw she has so much pain. The oldest of three, Astrid left home at 16. She had gotten pregnant as an excuse to move in with her boyfriend to escape the toxic home environment. She longed for her parents' love, but they were too wrapped up in their own problems to give it. Always feeling like I wasn't enough. You know, always feeling like I was lacking something. You know, you, I try to look for so many for things to fill that emptiness. By the time she was 19, Astrid was living with a different boyfriend, Jose. In the coming years, they'd have two sons. Like her parents, theirs was a toxic relationship. They often lashed out at each other, angry and hurt. He would always call me like, oh, you're trash, you know, nobody was ever gonna love you, look at you. Her self-image broken, Astrid started taking diet pills. I always think I'm so fat, you know? That's always my thing. I'm so fat, I'm so fat. And I just keep saying that to myself, you know? And I, I make it like an identity, like I am fat, you know? There was more. It made me forget about everything. In time, her addiction to diet pills gave way to cocaine and eventually crystal meth. First, it was like once time a day. Then at the end, it was like two, three times a day. Even for hours, I would go in the restroom Lock myself and I would just do drugs all day. Often her children would come home from school to find their mother strung out. Family members tried to convince Astrid to get help, but she refused. Twice, she tried to overdose, hoping she wouldn't wake up. How can you give love when you don't have it? How can you understand another person when you don't understand yourself? You know what I mean? And. How can I raise a home when I can't even raise myself? You know, I couldn't take care of my kids when I couldn't take care of my own, myself. The couple had been together 10 years when Jose decided he needed to turn his life around and started going to church, taking the kids with him. The few times Astrid did go with them, she was high. I would always fight with God. Even though, you know, I didn't believe him, that he was real. I would always fight with him. That was in my mind, hi, you know, that was, I would fight with God. Why you want me here? Why you don't let me die? You keep bringing me back when I wanna die and all this stuff. Then her 12 year old daughter told her she was moving out to live with her grandmother. So that was like where I hit rock bottom. It was like, I'm gonna lose my daughter because I put her through so much. It, it, it was like she slapped me like, wake up. There was no way out for me after this. I couldn't leave the drugs on my own. One Saturday night, Astrid tried again to kill herself by overdose. Well, you know, I was awake, so I was like, oh my God, I didn't die again, you know? So I started telling him, like, if you're that God that everybody says that you are, show me. I told him, change my life. I don't want to be this way anymore. Like, take this drug addiction away. Out of habit, she went into the bathroom to smoke some meth to satisfy the craving that had controlled her for years. And I couldn't anymore, it was gone. I just ran to the trash and I threw everything away. I was like, I don't want none of this in my house anymore, I'm free. God took it in that instant, it was gone. And he just didn't take the drug addiction, he took all the pain. The next morning, Astrid went to church with her family and accepted Jesus Christ into her heart. And I just felt like, a, it was like something that just pushed me. 
to the front. Like, if they grabbed me and took me there. And then I heard the voice that told me, I never left you, I was always with you. And I knew, I knew because that was my fight with God. Why you left me, why, you know? And I knew he was telling me like, I never did. I was always with you and I knew it was him. And it was like whole oh, deliverance. You know, I'm not saying my life has been perfect since then, but it has never been the same like before. Astrid and Jose began to live their lives for the Lord. They forgave one another and were married within the year. She also reconciled with her daughter. There isn't a day that goes by that Astrid doesn't think about what God did for her and her family. Like when you have that encounter with God, your life changes forever. You fall in love with Him and you'll never be the same. Yeah, that testimony brings tears to my eyes because what lie are you believing from, from the enemy? Are you believing the same lie that Astrid believed that God has left you? that he has forsaken you and that he doesn't care about you. If, if you have been feeling that for so long, friend, let me encourage you by the power of the Holy Spirit using me today to just encourage you and to speak truth into your life and into your heart that God has never left you. He has never forsaken you. He has always been with you, even during the dark times, even when you didn't know what was happening. Maybe you like Astrid also tried to take your own life because you just couldn't cope with the pain anymore. You couldn't cope with the things that you have done and you couldn't cope with going through it another day. Friend, I'm here to encourage you that Jesus Christ is there for you. He is ready, willing, and able to break through your situation right now, to break through your addiction to, to drugs, to alcohol, to pornography, anything that you are running to, to cope with the pain, anything that you are letting define who you are, God is ready, willing, and able to break through right now for you to just uproot any of those lies that you've believed so long about yourself and about the love of God. If you like Astrid wanna just cry out to the Lord like she did and say, God, if you are who you say you are, you're this loving God who can set people free. If that is you, can you show up in my life today? And as you just saw in Astrid's story, he did. She was freed from the drug addiction that had destroyed her life. And now she is living in freedom, walking that out with joy and peace and restoration in the relationships in her life. And I believe that is for you today. God is not a respecter of persons. What he did in Astrid's life, he wants to do for yours today. Now is the time the kingdom of heaven is here. So receive him today as your Lord and Savior. Pray this simple prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, say his name out loud. Get on your knees, friend. Surrender to him. Posture your body in surrender as you posture your heart in surrender. Jesus, I cry out to you. Lord, if you are who you say you are, will you show up for me? Will you show me that you have never left, will, left me? Will you break through my life right now, Jesus? Will you break these chains of addiction in my life? Jesus, I surrender to you right now. I turn from my wicked ways right now. I just renounce Satan in the name of Jesus. I turn from his influence in my life and I turn to you, Heavenly Father, my creator, my maker. Jesus, I believe that you walked this earth, that you died for me on the cross and that you resurrected three days later and that same resurrection power now lives inside of me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling me right now with your love, with your power. Thank you, Jesus. I choose you today, God. Set me free. Make me a new creation in you.
In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters who might have just prayed that prayer of full surrender. Jesus, Holy Spirit, will you just touch them even right now that the chains of addiction are broken in the name of Jesus. And from this moment forward, they are a new creation, a new mind, a new heart, a new body in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Friend, if you just pray that prayer with me, praise God. Today is a new day. We want you to do one more thing. Give us a call at 1-800-700-7000. We've got some free resources for you that are going to just help you on this new faith journey. We've got a teaching. It's called A New Day. There's also it's an audio teaching, but then there's a scripture reference guide as well. This is going to help you as you continue to just choose Jesus and walk out this faith journey. God bless you guys. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. The U.S. is recovering debris from the Chinese balloon the military shot down off the coast of South Carolina on Saturday. Tuesday, the Navy released images of a bomb disposal unit recovering pieces of the deflated balloon. Military leaders said the spy ship did not have the capability of gathering intelligence that posed a, quote, significant risk. Unmanned underwater vehicles are searching for wreckage from the balloon's massive technology bay. I want to turn now to the fight for Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky is in Britain today. It's his first trip to the United Kingdom since the war began last February. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak greeted him at the airport. Zelensky will meet with the PM and King Charles III, as well as make an address to Parliament. The U.K. has sent more than $2.5 billion in military aid to Ukraine for its defense against the Russian invasion. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Sadar's mother nearly fainted when she first saw her baby. Her dad was left speechless. That's because their little girl was born with a cleft lip. Baby Sonar was born with a cleft palate. Her family said they were heartbroken. When I gave birth, I did not realize my baby had a cleft lip until my sister showed me. I almost fainted. Sonar's dad was overwhelmed with emotion too. When I saw my daughter's lip, I was speechless. My heart was broken. Some people said we should give her away, but I said no. Baby Sonar lives with her parents, a brother, and six-year-old sister, Vate. They help their mom look after her. When my sister cries, I carry her to the coconut tree where we play. Some kids saw her and called her names. I was angry, but I did not know what to do. She chokes when she drinks milk. My parents don't have any money, so I don't know how we can fix it. Then Operation Blessing arranged for baby Sonar and her parents to travel to the city. There, we paid for her to receive free surgery to repair her cleft lip. Now I don't have to worry about my daughter's future. Now she can eat and drink without choking like before. She's gaining weight after the surgery. I'm glad my sister had surgery. Thank you to the people who made my sister's lips look like mine. She is so pretty. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. Why? Because a portion of every gift you give goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people around the world. And whether that's disaster relief, refugee relief, these special surgeries, one that you just saw, dramatic transformation, uh, giving that wonderful baby a whole new life, a whole new outlook. You're a part of everything we do when you join with us. So if that's you, if you want to be a part of this, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. We've got lots of levels for you. You can join at $20 a month. There's also $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. Whatever level, do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. You can call or you can go to CBN.com and give online or text to give. Text CBN to 71777. Do it now. Doug was rushed into surgery after crashing his car. Doctors held little hope for his survival. His blood had become toxic. His surgeon suspected serious internal bleeding.
Instead, she was shocked by what she saw. I, I remember sitting in the driveway of the house, and I'm like, no, no, no. Lord, help me. And I knew. Doug, where are you? That wasn't the time to have a meltdown. Lisa Zirkel had reason to worry. Her husband, Doug, Doug, a type 1 diabetic and kidney recipient, hadn't shown up to their earlier appointment, hadn't come home, and wasn't answering his phone. Very unlike the 58-year-old pastor. Something's really wrong. Did he go off the road? Did something happen? Panicked, Lisa called nearby Memorial Hospital and learned first responders had just brought him in. Doug had gone into diabetic shock and crashed his car into a ravine. They said, you just need to come now. And I'm like, whoa. At the ER, Lisa learned Doug had a broken back, two brain bleeds, and his blood pressure, already critically low, was falling. Both Doug and Lisa were taken to a local airport where a medically equipped airplane waited to take them to a trauma center in Denver. In flight, Lisa watched as two nurses struggled to keep her husband alive. I knew it was bad. Yeah, I, I did, I wasn't sure. I wasn't thinking, oh, he'll make it. I never thought that. I'm thinking, Lord, is this the day? Please, no. So, yeah. At UC Health, University of Colorado Hospital, Doug was rushed into surgery. His blood had become toxic, and doctors suspected there was internal bleeding. They were not optimistic he would make it. It was basically like, this is the last ditch effort. You know, we, we gotta do this, or we're just gonna watch him die. And I'm just praying like crazy. I'm like, Lord, what's going on? And just help me know what to do. Lisa called family and friends, and the news traveled quickly. As people prayed, doctors continued looking for answers. Then finally, after working on Doug for five hours, the surgeon came out to talk to Lisa. And she said, I kept him down there so long because I couldn't find anything wrong. She said, I looked and looked, I looked at his spleen, I was looking everywhere to see if I missed something. And she said, I couldn't find anything. And in fact, his organs looked pristine. There was more good news. Doug's blood pressure had improved and scans showed the brain bleeds had subsided. Lisa says there's only one explanation, prayer. Absolutely, no question, none. However, Doug still needed a surgery on his spinal cord and another miracle. Orthopedic surgeon, Dr. C.J. Kleck says even then, there were no guarantees he'd ever walk again. So from the standpoint of his spine, we were, we were concerned about one thing is function. So we needed to get his function back. We needed to get the nerves to recover. But the reality is it still comes down to fixing it and then watching. The surgery went as well as it could, and Doug would spend the next two weeks recovering in ICU before being moved to rehab. Fading in and out of consciousness, he began understanding what had happened to him. I remember hearing things like he may not walk, and I remember just saying, hey, am I gonna walk again? And I don't remember an answer. But I remember th just thanking God. It wasn't that I was alive. I was thanking God because he was with me. I just knew it. Several weeks passed and Doug still couldn't walk. Yet he didn't give up hope. I had different people loving me, lovingly pray for me and say things like, feel like you're gonna walk. You know what? I received it, I accepted it. I wasn't worried about it. Dr. Catherine Payne is the rehab unit's medical director. Looking at, at Doug, um, he had a, a severe injury. So um, I think we were anticipating that after leaving rehab, um, that he'd still probably be needing to rely on a wheelchair for mobility. When Doug was discharged and sent home, he still couldn't walk. He and Lisa, along with their church, continued to pray, refusing to give up hope. Even after I got home, I had continuous therapy for a while because my goal was to walk my daughter down the aisle on the next Father's Day. 10 months later, after much prayer and hard work, Doug reached his goal. The Lord was with me. 
I've never felt so assured of God's presence ever. Sometime after the wedding, Doug stopped by the rehab unit for a visit. They hadn't seen him since he went home. I vividly remember the first time he came up and he stood up and, and walked towards us and everyone, I think, was like cheering, so <laughs> shocked. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, so he's made tremendous progress. It's been really fantastic to see. You know, the first day he walked into clinic was, it was amazing. It doesn't always work that way, and so the days that you get to see it work that way, those are the ones you, you are excited for. Doug, Lisa, their kids and grandkids are thankful for every moment they have together and believe that God, through prayer, made it possible. It just really firmed up even more uh, my belief that, Lord, you're, you're in control. <laughs> it was just a car wreck, and to God's glory, he manifested his presence. And it's all about his glory, you know? Yeah, God. God comes through in our difficult times. He is our very present help in our time of need. It's my favorite time of the show where we get to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other miracle reports. Here's Donna sent an email. A few weeks ago, I noticed a sore on the roof of my mouth. It was pretty uncomfortable, painful when eating or drinking anything. In the large scheme of things, it didn't seem like anything important. I was listening to your soul while I was, show while I was working, as I do every day. Ashley mentioned that there was something, someone with a sore on the roof of their mouth who didn't think it was important enough to pray for. I knew that was for me. I thank God for answering the prayers I didn't even have the wisdom to ask for. Isn't that amazing? The next day, my mouth was all better, back to normal. Love you guys. Love your show. Oh, we love you. Yeah. That's amazing. Praise God. Well, here's Patricia. She also emailed us saying, during prayer for healing, Gordon said, someone is having issues with the colon. Just know that God has this. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. I claimed it, thanking God in advance for a healthy colon. I had an MRI a few days ago. The precancerous tumor is non-detectable. God had mercy on me. It's gone to me. This was a miracle. Absolutely, it was. Yeah. God wants to work miracles in your life. It's part of his very nature. I am the Lord who heals your disease. He calls himself healer. So if he names himself your healer, that means he wants to. You don't have to argue, bargain, or try to convince him. You just have to believe. Lord God Almighty, come to me in my moment of need. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you asking for healing for everyone in the audience, asking that you would stretch forth your hand to heal their disease. Do mighty miracles today, Lord, for we ask it. In Jesus' name. There's someone you have, a, uh, I just see this black mass uh, in an x-ray in your left lung. God is healing that. He's removing it from you now. In Jesus' name, you're being restored and healed. Just claim it for you right now in the name of Jesus. Ter uh, Ashley, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Lord, I just, uh, well, I also see somebody with a lung issue. It's almost like you've inhaled water and, and fluid has gotten into your lungs and it's it's just creating a whole bunch of different issues, fluid in the lungs. I just believe God is healing you and touching you right now. That fluid in your lungs is going to dissipate and it's not going to be there in Jesus' name. Just receive this healing from your heavenly Father who sees you and who loves you. Thank you, Lord. Someone has tremendous pain in, in their heart muscle. And it's, and it's like your heart is in a vice, a uh, vice that it, it is just being uh, compressed and it's ha having difficulty beating. God is healing your heart. Uh, go back and get rechecked. Your cardiologist is going to be amazed at what God is doing for you. You, you literally are getting a new heart. It's going to beat normally. Blood's going to flow normally. All the veins, all the arteries are going to be clear. Everything is going to be normal. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been healed, let us know. So let's share your good report. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day. And this wonderful word will watch over you. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.